Hello, this is Gary LaRue, the technical editor at uh, Microwave Journal. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's educational webinar taught by Al Horn of Rogers Corporation. Al will be discussing the measurement of passive intermodulation distortion in microstrip transmission lines, including the effects of laminate properties and measurement repeatability. Before Al begins, though, let me cover a few points about the webinar so you know what to expect. This will last about an hour with the first 45 to 50 minutes for Al's presentation. In the remaining time, he will answer your questions. So if you have a question as we go along, just type it using the Q&A box on the WebEx site. You'll find it to the right of the presentation. Please address your question to all panelists, which is the default setting. After the webinar, you will receive a copy of all the slides, and we're recording the presentation, so it will be available to watch again and share with your colleagues. You can find it in the event section of the Microwave Journal website, and it will be posted in about 24 hours. Now let me introduce Al Horn. Al received a Bachelor of Science degree from Syracuse University and a PhD from MIT, both in chemical engineering. He joined the Rogers Corporation Lurie R&D Center in 1987. At Rogers, he has worked on the development and testing of ceramic powder-filled high-frequency circuit substrates. Al is an inventor or co-inventor on 16 U.S. patents in the area of high-frequency dielectric materials. Al, we're looking forward to your presentation today. I'll turn it over to you. Yes, Gary. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, and thanks to all of you for attending today. Uh, so this will be uh, quite a practical treatment of our pin testing program at Rogers Corporation in the Advanced Circuit Materials Division. So while I have the honor of being the presenter today, of course, most of the work is done by the rest of the team. So I'd like to acknowledge Pat LaFrance and Chris Case here at the Lurie R&D Center, John Coonrod, Wayne Smith, and Art Aguayo at the Manufacturing Division in Chandler, Arizona, and Evan Wan and Sharon Young in China. Oops. What's going wrong? Here is a, yes. So anyways, this is a discussion outline. I assume that most people are familiar with them, but just in case there's some newbies on the line, we'll uh, review, you know, briefly, you know, exactly the you know, PIM itself. We'll discuss the PIM, you know, the PIM standard at the International Engineering Consortium, discuss the merits of reverse and forward PIM measurements, and then a description in detail of Rogers Laminate's PIM testing. Of course, one of the most important things that makes this quite tricky is the test repeatability and statistics that we'll spend some time on, discuss some of the PIM processing observations and experiments that we've done, and conclude with the conclusions. So intermodulation, remember in an ideal linear system where V equals IR perfectly, no new frequencies can be generated. So if, only, if F1 and F2 are input, then only F1 and F2 will be output. However, if a system is nonlinear, like a power amplifier nearing a saturation point, then intermodulation products can be generated in essentially differences of multiples of the input frequencies. And of course, assuming that you have some sort of narrow band multi-channel device like a telecom antenna, you know, only some of the odd intermodulation you know, products will occur in band. This is a uh, graphical representation, the black lines being the two fundamentals and the differences you know, appearing nearby. So now passive intermodulation, of course, is intermodulation generated by a passive system or device, such as a filter, power divider, or antenna. It's um, one of the things that makes it tricky to measure and somewhat you know, tricky to understand is that the power levels are extremely low. So even a very bad pin level of minus 133 dBC, reference to 20 watts, is like 10 to the minus 12 watts. 
And typical sources of nonlinearity, you know, in a base station system would be nearby ferrous materials, metal particles on a planar circuit, or metal particles and connectors, corroded connections, and stressed connectors. So yeah. Just a reminder, PIM is not a basic material property, like insertion loss, antenna efficiency, gain, return loss, and many other important electronic performance measures. It's a property of the circuit or system, not of the material. And it also depends on input power and frequency. However, there are material properties, such as copper profile, that when properly controlled can result in consistently lower PIM. So we build a certain Rogers internal standard circuit and test it at standard conditions to assess the relative PIM performance of all different, of our different laminate materials. So just a few other, yeah, so, you know, the third order PIM is always the highest in power. So if you measure a value, you know, for the IM3, you can be certain that IM5 and IM7 will be lower power. The IM3 depends on the third power of the current density. So different circuit designs will exhibit very different PIM values, you know, even when built on exactly the same material and connectors. One of our favorite examples is that they, you know, the Roger standard test, which is our 50 ohm transmission line pin circuit. If we ink this on 4730JXR laminate at 0.75 millimeters thick, we'll get a pin value of about minus 153 dBc. Well, we have a customer that builds a filter on this laminate that exhibits pin at the same frequency of minus 168. Okay, the PIM test methods are addressed by the IEC document TC46 W6G is in 62037. You know, this, the document is more a general treatment of good PIM practices rather than, you know, you know, specifying precisely how to test copper clad laminates. Our last, one of the more basic recommendations is using testing reverse PIM when possible, as we'll discuss. So we, you know, presently test for PIM using a test method that we had worked out many years ago with the help of Sumatec Instruments, which is now KLS. And uh, just the reverse and forward PIM measurements. So uh, in the case where, you know, passive intermodulation could be relatively high, and where it would emanate from multiple point sources, so say like, you know, several connectors, the reverse pin measurement actually can result in cancellation at certain frequencies, while the forward measurement does not. However, yeah, as when we're looking at low PIM or distributed sources like the transmission line and a microstrip laminate, this is not an issue. And both KLS and, as we mentioned, IEC recommend measuring reverse PIM when possible. And this is largely due to with the forward measurement. You have you're, so you're looking for the low power PIM signal, you know, in the same duplexer where the high power base signal falls upon. So it's uh, much easier when the you know, base signal is going to a load and it's just the reflected measurement that you're looking for. Okay, yeah, so we've been working on PIM since about 2001. And the method that we had, or the, our standard PIM test method dating from then is that we make a 300 millimeter long 50 ohm microstrip transmission line on one and a half millimeter laminate. And that's stiffened by lamination to a 1.5 millimeter thick you know, piece of FR4. We had for many years used DIN 716 coaxed microstrip to, you know, connectors soldered to each end. And port two of the test sample is connected to a low pin load. And we had done the 43 dBm or 20 watt two tone swept reflected measurements with a Sumatec, you know, 1900 instrument at 1900 megahertz. Yes, it's um yeah, well, once you hook the you know, you know, hook the test sample up to the instrument, 
as we'll discuss in more detail later, stress on the connectors and on the material can make a big difference in pin. So we manipulate the sample and connectors to get the best stable pin value over the swept frequency range. So we report the average pin value at 1870 megahertz of the up and down sweeps in DBC, which is of course reference to the carrier of 20 watts. For those who use you know, DBM or DB, you know, the DBM value was the DBC plus 43 for the power level of the base tones. And the pin tester performance is checked before and after each test section with a pin source and a low pin load. So this is what our setup looks like, because here is the test sample itself connected directly to the instrument. We have it in a fixture to try to help reduce the stress on the joints. And here you will see the low pin load. Yes, here's a close up of the GIN 716 to microstrip connectors and with the stiffener on the back and here soldered to the ground. Just Yeah, so anyway, you know, DIN 716 is currently used for many connections and base station antenna systems, but you know, over the years we have noticed that most, most coax to microstrip connections are now made through a low pin solder braided cable you know, and a simple you know, coax to microstrip connector. So it's become much more widespread. And so I, and also, due to the very large growth in the telecom industry since 2001, pin testing equipment has become much more widely used, more user-friendly and less expensive. So we are now you know, adding additional pin testing capability at our Suzhou and Chandler locations with the KLS 1921C portable pin analyzer. Again, I'll tell you, the test circuits are very much the same, one and a half millimeter you know, or trans 50 ohm transmission lines on one and a half millimeter thick circuits. We are using the 141 flexible solder plated low pin cable as a nice compromise for power handling and for uh, being flexible and, you know, being more flexible than the 250s. And we use the lightweight coax uh, micro strip solder connectors. Now, with the new instrument, we measure pin versus time at 18700 or 1870 megahertz generated by fixed 1990 megahertz and 1930 megahertz tones. And again, of course, manipulate the connections and you know, reduce the stress on them to get the past pin levels. And we, yes, when we had all three instruments together at one time, we spent a month demonstrating to ourselves that we get the same values on all three instruments. So this is now the front panel of the new pin testing equipment and a photograph of our test samples. You know, as I said, the stress in the connectors is, you know, is, you know, can cause spurious, you know, high values of pin. So yes, we actually have, yes, a, my colleague, Chris Case, with his 3D printer, has made these fixtures here, which essentially hold the flange of the connector tight against the board and reduce the stress on the joint. So here you now see the DIN 716 coming to the flexible cable and then to the low pin load. And I said this is what the new samples look like now with the solder connection from the coax to microstrip. So now for reporting PIM values, what we call a single sample is four of these circuits on a 12 by 18 panel, and we measure each one of them, again, trying to get the best value on the up and down, and then record the values, <clears throat> and then Again, for gauging the, you know, the capability of the test system, we'll put everything away and come back and make the measurements then on a second day. As one of the things with pin testing, we'll discover that sometimes the second measurements will be considerably lower. Presumably that there is something has happened, like a crack 
you know, either in the trace or in the solder joint or perhaps in the cable itself. So we'll uh, discard those values and then, yes, you know, compare the averages. I said, yeah, as part of our you know, gaining an understanding in pin testing, we have purposely obtained a very wide range of data from minus 105 to 175 dBC, looked at high-profile foils, added ferrous metals, and conductive particles to help understand the test. But yes, if, as long as you're not doing anything unusual and looking at a low-loss dielectric laminate, as long as the cladding is pure copper, and nothing is added to increase PIM, the major controlling variable related to a laminate is the foil roughness. Yeah, so here we have a plot of RQ, the RMS copper profile, which of course we're able to measure before we put it onto the laminate, and then plot it against the resulting PIM values that we get on the one and a half millimeter you know, laminates with 50 ohm transmission lines. Is, um, one of the reasons that we had learned so much about PIM is that one of our candidate you know, antenna materials, the RO4000, you know, it was originally formulated with a fairly high profile copper foil, which resulted in rather poor PIM. And it's the development of being able to get low profile foil to adhere well to RO4000, it's allowed us to have good, you know, low PIM candidate materials. I said, yeah, the major concern I think that everybody is aware of who's actually done the test is test repeatability. As if you hook a sample up to the, you know, up to a unit and have everything adjusted so it's behaving nicely, you'll still see fluctuations of plus or minus three dBC. And you know, this is consistent with what everybody specifies for repeatability of pin sources and test equipment in general. And if we you know, base our statistics on the four sample measurement, and then you know, so we're looking at you know, including you know, disconnection and reconnection, when we're measuring uh, low PIM values in the range of better than minus 155, we'll get a 95% confidence limit of about plus or minus 6 dBC. So uh, clearly, repeated samples and measurements are necessary to understand material performance. Yeah, here's a graphical representation of our PIM measurement repeatability. Each one of these points represents, you know, the you know, average PIM value for the four samples. So here, this point was on the first day, was measured at about minus 140, and on the second day, it was measured at about minus 143. The line. You know, this black line is the y equals x, so if it was a perfect measurement system, all of the points would lie on this line. You could see that, uh, somewhat ironically, that if we have bad pin values, we can actually measure them quite repeatedly. But when you get into the range of what it is that you're actually interested for in, yes, in building a telecom antenna, which is better than 150 dBC, you'll see that the 95% confidence limit is about plus or minus six. Of course, you know, the you know, repeatably, or repeatability of measurements that are affected by normal random variation improves by a factor of one over the square root of n, where the n is the number of measurements. With all the measurements that we've been making, particularly with our new units, we have assured ourselves that this is true, so we've have demonstrated, again, that the, you know, the square root dependence said we're, you know, currently, you know, for a normal test, use our groups or our, you know, our groups of four samples. Yeah, as I said, and if we doubled the testing, we of course could you know, improve the confidence limit. So anyways, with a 95% confidence limit of plus or minus six dBC, you know, the significant you know, measurement variation is more than you might think. Normally, if you ask somebody if you measure something, you know, you know, if you measure something twice, what's the most likely outcome? They will say that you'll get close to the same value. 
However, as the following Monte Carlo simulation demonstrates, you know, for, you know, if you make these measurements on consecutive days, you know, the most likely outcome, in fact, is that one of the day's measurements will have a higher value by 3 dBc or more. Yeah, so the Monte Carlo name is, you know, or Monte Carlo method is so named since it's supposed to sort of simulate a real gambling session. Uh, it's been made quite easy and accessible to all through, you know, through the Excel R&D function. So what you would want to do is randomly, you know, generate, you know, a thousand actual values that fit a distribution with a mean of minus 157 and a standard deviation of three to simulate the first measurement, generate another column of a thousand for the second measurement, and then look at the difference between the two measurements. So if you, you know, of course, if you take the average, it will be very close to zero. However, if you look at the absolute values, the result will be quite different. So what we're looking at here is the table that we had generated. These are the last 10 of the thousand entries so this was a, you know, the run one values and run two values. You can see that the you know, average is, in fact, very close to minus 157, which was the input, and that the standard deviation is very close to three. And if you take the average difference between them, you will see that it is very small. But if you take the average of the absolute difference, you'll see that it's greater than three. So one way of telling what's going your outcome is going to be is to generate a cumulative distribution. So on the x-axis, we have the difference between the two measurements, you know, and on the y-axis is the per, you know, yeah, percent of comparisons with less than that difference. You could see at 50%, 50 we're right about at three. So half the time, the you know, difference between what should be exactly the same numbers is larger than three. And in fact, and it's only less than 20% of the time that the difference is less than one. And even 10% uh, even of the time, the difference will be larger than seven. Yeah, so the real conclusion to the PIM statistics part is if you really want to understand moderate PIM differences, many measurements must be made. Yes, and in spite of this, with the purchase of our new PIM testing equipment, we are starting to regularly measure PIM as a production reference test. Yeah, so that brings us now to our PIM and processing observations. And like I said, just uh, you know, kind of yeah, you know, to reiterate again, due to the large you know, the, the, you know, of the large standard deviation of the measurements compared to what it is that we're looking for, it does take a lot of time to figure out you know, what a real you know, or what is really different. But nonetheless, over the years, we have noted things that are significant. Like I said earlier, stress in the material connector and solder joint have a large effect on PIM. Every customer that we you know, that we speak to as you know, sees the same thing. But as I said, we you know, we and I believe just about everybody else is you know, very, of course tries to manipulate the sample and joints during testing to obtain the lowest PIM values. Yeah, you know, is to exactly you know, as a material scientist, you know, how stress in a low loss linear dielectric material or in copper or solder can affect the linearity, you know, of the you know, of an electromagnetic wave is beyond me. And uh, you know, if there's anybody in the audience that has an explanation, we'd be extremely interested to hear. As I mentioned earlier, the pin values depend highly on the current density in the conductors, the higher density leading to higher pin. That's so our, you know, our standard input power level for many test protocols, you know, including ours, is 20 watts or 43 dBm. And we're on, a, as I mentioned, the one and a half millimeter laminate and 50 ohm transmission line. So circuits that have lower current density will exhibit lower PIM, and circuits that have higher current density will exhibit higher PIM. 
Again, back to one of our favorite examples in which a material with a pin, you know, typically in the 150 to 155 range with 220 watt tones at 1870, when, you know, is, when tested as a transmission line, when the same thing is tested as a filter in the same frequency range, you get a, a very large improvement in pin. That's another way to look at it. It's like, of course, the, you know, if you have a 50-ohm transmission line on a thinner laminate, it's going to have considerably higher, you know, current density. But again, on you know, on one and a half millimeter laminate with 4730 JXR, we're looking at a value of about minus 163 dBc, and on three-quarter millimeter laminate of the exactly same material and all same conditions, the values are more typically in the 150 to 155 range. So, um, you know, 4350B laminate, you know, is, you know, is actually our standard high-profile foil that's not generally, or that we don't recommend as an antenna grade, yeah, so largely because it exhibits high PIM. However, we had a customer that was interested in using it in low-power, you know, systems, and sure enough, if you, you know, you know, even, you know, a, you know, even a material like 4350B, which is not optimized for low PIM at high power, will exhibit low PIM at lower power levels. So here in this table, we're looking at the 20 watts, you know, on these on our standard test sample, and that's getting a value of about minus 145 dBc. On the thinner laminates, yeah, you'll know. Yeah. So you get a higher value at the 20 watts, but as you reduce the power level, both the you know, DBC and even more markedly the you know, DBM power level of the pin signal is reduced significantly. Of course, as uh, you, you always read that small amounts of oil of any kind of magnetic material or ferrous material, uh, so, you know, you know, powder can cause a large increase in pin. We wanted to see it happen ourselves, so I made up a, a single thin layer of a dielectric with less than a percent of iron powder in it and sandwiched it in the center of a 1.5 millimeter laminate. When we measured the dielectric constant and dissipation factor, they were completely unaffected. However, the PIM was 120 dBc, and without the added iron, it was better than 157. And we also have a customer that tells a story of having done some PIM work at a university in which for the first six months they were never able to get a good PIM value on anything, which they then discovered was due to the deteriorating carbon-filled foam that was sitting on the shelf above their bench. I said similarly, metallic powder on a dielectric surface can cause very bad PIM. Years ago, a colleague was going to show me how removing copper oxide would improve PIM, so he took a piece of 600 grit sandpaper, and as soon as he touched the surface with, sand, with the sandpaper and generated some copper particles, there was a large increase in PIM. Yes, we've actually you know, used that now routinely, I kind of those both to show executives that we actually are measuring something with this device, and also to make us more certain of our, you know, to give us a range of pin values that we could obtain for our gauge capability analyses. So we could start with better than a minus 160 dBc material, sand it just a little bit and get a, you know, a pin increase, sand it more and get a very, you know, get a much larger pin increase, and then wipe the surface with a solvent soak rag, remove the particle, you know, remove the copper particles and see the pin improve significantly. It's all quite convincing what is done while hooked up to the instrument itself. So similarly, if a sample is under etched and there's nodules or copper that are left in the dielectric, you'd expect to see bad PIM. 
customers have told us that this happens, uh, and we have tried on several occasions but not been able to recreate the effect in a controlled manner. What we have been able to recreate in an uncontrolled manner was demonstrating that etching residue on the surface causes poor PIM. As we, uh, you know, a year ago, we had recently installed a new etcher here at R&D, but the rinse section was not functioning properly, so we were essentially rinsing our circuits with copper ion containing water, and the coupons exhibited poor PIM. So after the initial you know, testing, while they were uh, with the circuit still hooked up to the testing unit, we you know, just cleaned them by wiping with 10% sulfuric and DI water, and you could see the pin values you know, come up you know, you know, you know, immediately you know, upon the washing and rinsing. We're looking at improvements from the 135 to 139 range to like better than minus 150. Customers have always told us that they see better PIM with solder mask and also with immersion tin plating. At one time in the last few years, we had uh, looked into this, and sure enough, on looking at you know 50 ohm transmission lines on you know on 0.75 millimeter laminate, we we're uh, yes on a on the standard 4534 material and beer copper, we're just getting pin values of 144, which improved with a you know, again on the yes on the same laminate when immersion tin and solder mask were applied. There's a significant improvement, and yes, we've seen that like I said, seen this on a number of materials, and yes, we, yeah, so indeed it makes a difference. It's somewhat hard to guess what the mechanism might be. There's, you know, amongst other things that people kick around, it's just that, you know, you know, perhaps the cleaning that goes into the, you know, cleaning the surface before the tin plating or cleaning before solder mask is what's actually resulting in the improvement. And customers report that ENIG results in poor PIM, and that's uh, not hard to believe since it's a yeah, a magnetic or a ferrous metal, and is a, you know you know of course right on the trace itself. Recently, we tried to set up a PIM processing experiment you know, to systematically look at the effects of various processing changes on PIM. He's included a slight underetch in comparing cupric chloride and ammoniac collection chemistry and combinations of solder mask, bare copper, and tin plating. Also, hot air solder level, immersion and immersion silver and immersion tin, and micro etch versus pumice scrub. So we were hoping that many of the factors that had led to improvements in the PIM in the past would be consistently demonstrated. Unfortunately, our control circuits were on the one and a half millimeter 4730JXR laminate, and the PIM values were already, uh, or the baseline PIM value was better than minus 160 dBC, so nothing could be consistently better. Although at least none of the factors that we invested, you know, investigated, showed a significant, you know. Decrease either. Yeah, so this brings us to the conclusion of the technical portion of the presentation. And just to recap some of the major points the PIM is not a material property, it is a circuit and system property that depends on many variables. But so there are certainly things that, as a laminate manufacturer, we can do to improve the PIM that our customers can obtain. So, uh, due to the high variability of PIM when testing near the noise floor, many multiple samples are required to differentiate between relatively low PIM materials. A said laminate copper profile is a major variable affecting the PIM of microstrip transmission lines, and Rogers is committed to monitoring PIM performance of our antenna grade materials. And now, if I look at the time, I guess this leaves us a few minutes for a commercial for Rogers Low PIM materials. As uh, you know, I said, so you know, historically, our PTFE materials 
have had uh, you know, have used low profile copper foil when possible, the best being rolled annealed. So since copper roughness is normally the major variable, our PTFE materials with rolled foil have always exhibited very low pin values. So these RO3000 series laminates are silica filled for low Z axis CTE, low temperature coefficient of dielectric constant, and relatively high thermal conductivity. So, I'll risk for future reference. These are electrical properties. I said all of them consistently exhibit better than 160 dBc pair. Now, I said the what had originally launched us, uh, yes, the large PIM investigation was the relatively poor performance of the standard RO4000 thermoset material. Yeah, fortunately, in the last few years, a colleague far smarter than I finally came up with a good method of getting low-profile reverse-treated foil to exhibit good adhesion to 4,000 materials. So this has you know, allowed us to develop a family of low-PIM 4,000 laminates. So the RO4500 and 4700 antenna-grade laminates exhibit rigidity, low CTE, temperature coefficient of dielectric constant, and low-cost circuit processing that typifies all 4,000 laminates. Again, for future reference, these are, you know, so, uh, these are the properties. Here you're saying and with the most recent introductions being lower dielectric constant 4,000 materials that are based on using, you know, hollow sphere fillers. Yes, now in January 2015, Rogers finalized the acquisition of Arlon Corporation. So I am now finally permitted to say that she's in fact are the good materials that they have always been. Yes, yeah, so their woven glass PTFE ceramic filled laminates are widely used in telecom, you know, antenna applications requiring low PIM, and the ADC series is priced for high volume applications. And again, these are the properties for future reference. And that brings us to the final conclusion of our presentation. I guess, and now we're open for questions. Thank you, Al. Um, good presentation, and you have generated a number of questions from the audience. And a um, couple of comments before I start with the questions. For those of you who have asked, will you get a copy of the slides? Yes, you will receive an email shortly after the conclusion of the webinar and uh, with the instructions for how to get a copy of the slides. Also, we do have some time, so if you have some questions that you have not yet asked, feel free to type them into the Q&A box at the side of the presentation uh, screen, and uh, we'll entertain as many questions as we possibly can. So a number of questions relate, Al, to the, the mechanism in the dielectric material that's causing the PIM. Uh, one question is, is it something that can be characterized and ultimately simulated? Well, again, not that we're aware of, as I had seen some university work where they were trying to correlate, you know, you know say something like insertion loss with PIM, but it's you know, simply not that simple. It's it's not that it's lossier; it's you know, it's it's the nonlinearity, you know, that's generating the PIM products and. And you had you had said it's basically not a material parameter, and yet would the exception to that be ferrite material, ferrous materials? Oh well, no, no I meant uh, say, no. There are yeah, no, there are there certainly are materials that will cause you know, you know, nonlinearity. You know, in the electromagnetic field, so I didn't mean to imply that. I guess what I meant when I was saying is not a material property is that there isn't a single value. You know, if you're making something like a laminate, there isn't a single value associated with that laminate material. Got it. Yes, yeah, but certainly, you know, you know anything magnetic that exhibits you know, a hysteresis when interacting you know, with, a, you know, with an electromagnetic wave you know, will in fact generate very bad PIM. It's a, you know, Andrew said the copper, you know, the high-profile copper, for reasons that are not clear to me, 
also generates the nonlinearity. You know, I guess you can tell because the PIM is higher, I think. Right. So an, another question related to PIM, would you consider it to be time variant or time invariant? Well, yeah, you know, see, there's, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem to be, you know, you know, we've looked a couple of times at, you know, at PIM, what, you know, as laminates have just sat around at, you know, at room, you know, at normal conditions, and it's not like it gets worse. But again, okay. if, you know, you know, in you know, in the more general case, I mean, something like corrosion in a connector, you know, that could you know contribute to causing a nonlinearity would be something that would be time variant. Cause... So it would be accelerated or or made worse potentially by um, things like corrosion. Well, and the corrosion, you know, but yeah. uh, so, you know, in the laminate itself, I don't think so. Let's say. Got it. Um, one question, what was the noise floor of the system that you were using um, to, to do your, your PIM measurements? And what would you expect the PIM to be just due to the cables and connectors and launches without considering the... the oh, we, are, we actually test the cables before we, uh, yeah, before we split them and solder them on. You know, and that, you know, that does come out very close, you know, in the, you know, well, you're, you're always better than minus 160, which is what the cable manufacturer guarantees. You know, and we're looking, you know, with the low PIM load hooked up directly to the instrument, we're looking at consistently better than minus 170. Okay. Have you ever considered the frequency dependence of PIM? Have you done any um, evaluation of that? Um, no, but we're planning on it. There's a here. I see it now that the uh, you know that the portable instruments are available. You know, we were looking forward to evaluate you know, to evaluating a number of you know, of the transmission line samples. You know, as a frequency. So we'll have to plan a follow up webinar to discuss yeah, that one. The cumulative the data. Perhaps, or perhaps look for a microwave journal article. I think. There you go. So, a question: Does the Rogers four thousand three material have the same peri uh, PIM characteristics as Rogers forty forty three fifty? Yeah, actually, these. Um, well, again, depending on how strictly you read four thousand three, you know, say, you know, with the standard high-profile foil, it will, you know, it doesn't exhibit particularly good ping. You'd be looking at about minus one forty-five by our standard test method. But this forty-five thirty-three is the four thousand three C, you know, with the low pro copper. Or actually, it's the 4534, and the 4533 is the slightly lower dielectric constant version. So those would be used in place of the 4003 in a... In a so that's the 4003 with the low pro, which is what's yeah. recommended for, you know, for the antenna applications. Okay. Uh, one of our viewers asks whether you have any comments on immersion tin plating versus electroplating. Okay, so it's not something that we've looked at. There's a, so no, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. All right. Let's see what else we've got here. Um, on slide fifty-one, you had a comment about reverse treated foil. What do you mean by that? Oh, okay. So um, you know. Yeah. Standard electrodeposited copper foil is made by you know by plating copper onto a slowly rotating, highly polished you know stainless steel or titanium drum. So it's something like you know two meters in diameter and two and three meters wide. Yeah. So on the drum side, the foil is you know the foil is shiny as it picks up the highly polished surface. On the bath side, it's rough. And historically, if the copper foil manufacturers were making it for printed circuits, they you know you know they would tailor the roughness and then plate an additional treatment onto the rough side. 
Yeah, however, I said in the, you know, because of both etch definition and you know insertion loss and PIM reasons, it's, you know, it was clear that smooth copper was highly desirable. You know, there is a uh, an alternate way of making copper foil by actually mechanically rolling it, but the uh, that's limited in width and is somewhat more expensive. So what the revert or what the ED copper manufacturers did was come up with now running their process to make it as smooth as possible on the bath side and applying the treatment to the drum side so it has a very low profile. So in a way, it's the, it's the ED, it's, a, it's an electro-deposited foil that's been made to have very low profile by putting the treatment, you know, to make it stick to the laminate onto the smooth side of the foil. All right, thank you for that one. Um, a question, do you think that adopting a strip line design rather than micro strip would improve PIM performance? Well, it's certainly not going to make it any easier to measure. So, of course, you'd have to lodge through a plated through hole. And I said, well, we know that plated, you know, we, we have seen plenty of pin, uh, of low pin designs that had plated through holes, but we have also had a number of customers that had, you know, uh, that had difficulties, you know, designing them and still obtaining good pin. All right. And can you talk about, um, you, you talked about the thickness of the metal, but how about the circuit thickness in terms of impacting PIM performance? And I assume they mean the laminate thickness. Oh, well, I guess, you know, yeah, the real issue is the current density. So if, you, you know, if you're you know, confining your interest to 50 ohm transmission lines, the thicker the laminate, the wider the line, and at the same power level, it's lower, you know, lower current density. So thicker laminates will, you know, exhibit lower PIM, you know, impedance being the same. Right. Another question, since the PIM depends on the power level, what would you expect at levels that are getting up into the kilowatt range, say two kilowatts? Oh, I think they'd be quite, yeah, I think they'd be quite high. In fact, I think that was actually the first, yeah, the first time that they noticed PIM in the 70s was from, you know, satellite you know, transmission there that was at that kind of power level, but this, It was high enough that it was obvious to notice. Yes. Yeah, although, you know, again, when it's in, you know, in the telecom antennas, the issue is that it's a transmit-receive antenna. So, you know, and the received signals are very low. So what's generated in the antenna itself at very low values, you know, is a concern. And right. something like the satellite systems, or if it's a different antenna for transmit than receive, you know, then you'd be concerned about a different magnitude of PIM. Is another question: Do you see any relation, or have you evaluated uh, the level of PIM with the shape of the tested microstrip line, where by shape the a uh, person means the vertical profile of the microstrip line. Oh no, the convey. You know, well, I assume you mean the taper, the, the the you know the trapezoidal shape of the of the trace, and uh, you know that's been something that people always discuss as being you know, you know. But again, we have been unable to get a controlled change in the degree of the you know of taper. In order, yes, in order to try to, you know, to try to quantify that. So I guess if somebody knows how to do that, then again, it'd be something we'd be very interested in. Have there been any works that correlate PIM to the resulting jitter when a signal is passing through a transmission line? Well, um, no, it's because, you know, they're, they're different phenomena. Yeah, so it wouldn't, you know, remember the, you know, the, the PIM is, you know, essentially being generated from, you know, discrete carrier frequencies. You know, and it's just, um, yeah, not the same thing, you know, right. in a digital system. 
A uh, question here about microstrip lines. Can the thermal expansion of the laminate be the cause of PIM? Well, you know, again, no, because we can, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the, you know, that, um, what makes a nice experiment for that is actually yes, this RT Duroid 5880 which is a very low pin material, actually is a very high coefficient, has a very high z-axis coefficient of thermal expansion, you know, and compared to something like the 3003, which is silica-filled, you know, has a z-axis CTV of about 30 parts per million compared to over 200 for the 5880, and both exhibit good pin, you see? Okay. Uh, another question related to coplanar waveguide um, and and how it compares in terms of PIM performance. I think you may have addressed this. Um, well, no, actually not, and I'm not sure. I say again, I believe that there can be you know higher. I mean, it it depends on what all you're going to be holding constant when you design the coplanar waveguide. But I believe that it does have higher current density at the edges, which you wouldn't guess would be helpful from there. Right, right. All right. Uh, question uh, clarifying the point that you would suggest immersion tin rather than silver. As as well as adding a solder mask to improve PIM. Well, again, we've seen uh, so when we did the experiment with the silver, we didn't see it get any better, but it's not like it got any worse either. And the immersion tin and solder mask is something that we've heard from several customers, and we've seen it happen once. It's a yeah, you know, well, or several times in that experiment. It's a All right, and then do you have any um, experience of uh, PIM with multi-layer boards and how it changes? So again, other than having heard from customers that it can be tricky to design with through holes and get good PIM, but that we've seen customers that have done so, no, we're seeing. So, uh, last question, I think. Um, do you have any kind of concluding best practices that you would recommend from a design standpoint for someone whose application is sensitive to PIM? Well, I think other, other than the obvious part of watching the current density, you know, you know, to be sure to try to, you know, to make sure that there aren't, you know, you know high density, you know, segments in the board. Yeah, so try. I guess that, and you know, said, you know, and dividing the power down, you know, to step the power level to as low as possible as soon as possible. Let's say, or things that designers have told us. Uh, say. All right, that's very helpful. So I'd like to thank, um, thank you, Al. Um, we're pretty much near the end of our time. And uh, we've gotten through all the questions. I'm glad we had enough time to uh, to get a fair number of questions and also answer them. So I'd like to thank Al Horn and Rogers Corporation for today's webinar. It was uh, very interesting um, on a subject that's become increasingly important, certainly in the in the wireless industry over the last decade. Let me wrap up with a couple of reminders. Everyone who registered for the webinar will receive a copy of Al's slides. You'll get an email shortly. And we've recorded the webinar, so you can um, watch it again. Or if you think it's useful, please recommend it to a colleague so they can log on and watch it in the future. And it will be posted in the Microwave Journal uh, website in the event section in about 24 hours. So thank you for joining us today, and have a nice day.